It is good to have you here this morning. Always a good day to be here on a Sabbath. I feel like especially today. Coming out of the fog into the light. That's what we're hoping for for some today. So we've been starting in on our worship service here today. Been talking about one of the greatest blessings that we have. The way that God gets a ragtag group of people from all different walks of life, from all parts of the world, and somehow brings us all together into one family, one body, as Paul puts it. And it's amazing how he's able to unify such a diverse group. I've always wondered, even just among the disciples, how he managed to get a zealot and a tax collector in the same boat. But God has a way of bringing together people. And it's one of our greatest blessings. We have as we tend to affectionately talk about it, we have brothers and sisters in Christ. And especially as we have our time to share our praises and our prayer requests, I'm encouraged that we have people we can talk to. I've noticed even the world outside the church has caught on that we're really missing something nowadays, a third place. A lot of people talk about it. We have our home and we have our job or maybe school, but where's that, that other place? that you can go just to be with people. There's fewer and fewer of them nowadays. And church, at its best, is that and so much more. Yes, it's a place where we can be around people that we have something in common with. And yeah, maybe we can even do some activities together. But it's a place where we also find hope and encouragement for a long week. But there's a side effect, as it were, of having this sort of community, of having brothers and sisters in the faith that I think we don't really talk about a whole lot. Eh, you might call it a downside. I don't think that's quite fair, but it is something that we should take into account more than we usually do. So to paint the picture, we're going to look at Paul. Paul had the most to say about this. He had a lot to say about new churches and having fellowship, the brothers and sisters all together. And I want to look first in Romans. I want to start at what might seem like an unusual chapter to do a sermon about here. This is Romans chapter 14. Romans 14 is often used, well, against us, is a short way of putting it. I'll read a couple of verses and I think I'll, you'll see what I mean. Romans chapter 14. Romans 14 begins like this. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. This is an important point. This is the whole topic. This is the point that he's going to talk about for a while. With that in mind, he continues. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. As a vegetarian, I feel slightly offended. Keep going. <laughs> Verse 3. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. And we're not just talking about food. Hang on for the ride. Verse 4 continues, Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Ooh, so we're not just talking about a vegetarian diet. We're talking about the days that we esteem. And so you can see how this verse, this chapter is often used to say, why do you guys care so much? Why do you guys go to church on Saturdays when everybody else goes on Sundays? Why do you try to eat a little healthier and try to follow what it said way back in Leviticus about which foods might be a little healthier for you when in the end God made everything? All right. Do you remember where Paul started this whole topic? Receive one who is weak in the faith, he said way back in verse 1, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Hmm. Two things that we have to remember from way back in these days, the time of Paul, there were two big controversies going on. And I think if we can try to put ourselves in their shoes for a minute, it makes some sense, honestly. For many of us here, these aren't really topics that keep us up at night. 
but you could see how they would have been back then. The first group, those who grew up Jewish, keeping all of the festivals that are outlined in those first five books of the Bible, especially Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, outlining things like Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and the Passover. And these have been kept for hundreds of years. And now, when Paul's writing this, we're maybe, maybe a decade or two after Jesus died and rose again. And all of a sudden, you have new believers joining the faith. They believe in Jesus as their Savior. But now the big question is, what about all those feast days? In order to be a Christian, do you also need to keep the festival, like their thanks, version of Thanksgiving with the festival of the wave sheaf and the first fruits? Do you need to keep the festival of booths remembering the time in the wilderness? There's a lot of great memories in there, but do you still have to do those? And there was quite a debate going within the church to the point that they will eventually have to hold a big meeting. And there's a bit of a showdown between Peter and Paul over this one where they're finally trying to come down to what exactly do Christians believe? But in the meantime, it's a pretty debated topic. The second one, that's for those who have grown up believing in what we now call the Old Testament, and now they have accepted the Messiah that had been promised, and he finally came. The son of a carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth, is the one. But now you've got people on the other side, people who grew up far from God, often worshiping a wide range of gods in the world of Greece and Rome. The best thing that Paul could come up to say it when he came to Athens, their capital city there for Greece, the best thing he could come up with, the common ground that he found with them is that, well, I can see that you guys are really religious. I came into town and I saw a lot of gods. So, what if you grew up with a family altar to the god that your parents liked the best? And every time that you go out to the market to buy something, you find that there they have their little altar to the god that they worship. And everything there in their shop is dedicated to this god. Well, now that you've heard about the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who sent his son to die in our place, you've accepted him as your savior. But what about all those other gods? And what about that food that you know has been offered to those idols? Are you going to eat it or not? Like I say, not really things that weigh on our hearts a whole lot nowadays. And I got to thinking, actually, even a lot of times, any sort of Southeast Asian restaurant, Thai food, Chinese food, you often find an idol there in the restaurant. <laughs> Hasn't really been something that weighs on my conscience very much. But you think if you grew up that way, if that is what you had worshipped your whole life, and then you come to God, you could see how that might give you some pause. And to make things even worse, if you're going to try to avoid all idols, generally a good idea, but what about the idol that's there in your parents' front room? So you can't go home and visit your family anymore? These are questions that are really weighing on them. So Paul jumps in here about that food that's been offered to an idol or not, because especially the meat, because the animal is offered to the idol and then sacrificed and killed and then butchered, and there you go. That's the meat that you're buying. Or those days, are you going to keep all of those Jewish festivals or not? And as Paul weighs in on this one, honestly, I would expect Paul to come down on one side or the other. And remembering that these letters were usually written, delivered to that church, and then read out loud in front of everybody, I can kind of imagine the different camps here in the church. It's going to, all right, Paul's finally going to say something. He's going to I know he's going to finally say that I was right all along. <laughs> but here's where he goes. Verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. 
Hmm. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. A bit like, yes, and amen, but where are you going with this, Paul? We're trying to come down to an answer here. Who is right? And you're just talking about we're always the Lord's. Well, yes. And he goes on to say that really, verse 12, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? Ooh. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Wow. That's definitely a part of the Christian message that is not very popular anymore. Yes, we are all united in love. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We have hope. But there's also a judgment. That part's not so much fun to talk about. And as verse 12 says, So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. And now, before anybody goes worrying too much about, Ooh, if God's going to look over my whole life, I know it's not going to be good. <laughs> yes, praise God, that's not what this is all about. But hang on just a minute. Where does Paul wrap this up? Verse 13. Therefore, okay, so how do we make sense of all of this? Where are we going with all of this? We started out saying that we need to not dispute over doubtful things. Where do we end up? Verse 13 says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. Okay, this idea I think is ringing true with especially sort of our modern culture at this point, this idea that no one can judge me. Even those who do believe in God, the idea that, well, my beliefs are between me and him. And who are you to tell me what's right and what's wrong? Not quite where we're going, though. No, that would be far easier. Notice how Paul closes out the idea. But rather, resolve this. Not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. That is what we have to avoid. Don't get in the way of what God is doing in your brother's life. And here he finally gets to the heart of it, these two verses, 14 and 15. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. So, wow. The OKC side over here is like, yeah, that's right. You tell him, I knew it. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. You say, oh, all right, so it's a matter of conscience. Okay, so I can still do whatever I want as long as my conscience doesn't tell me it's wrong. Hang on a minute. Verse 15, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Man, Paul really hits it hard. This isn't just a matter of who is right in the end. And it's not even about having a right to do something. Yes, maybe you are right. Maybe that food that was offered to that idol, in the end, it's not really a big deal. We'll get to that more in just a minute. But if you're going to put your food above the impact that that's going to have in your brother, you're doing this wrong. What's really more important? Don't get in the way of what God is doing in their life just because you're right. Amen. And he continues here. Verse 16, Therefore, let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those are the things that we're supposed to be looking for. That's what, we're, that's what our goal is. That's what we should look like. We shouldn't be known as the people who are right. We should be known as the people who have the righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's a whole lot harder than just being right, for being honest. But it makes a lot more of an impact.
So where else? Paul goes on to talk about this quite a bit more. It's worth reading. But another spot where he tackles this same topic, but with a different group of believers, is in the next book, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It's a different group of people, but it's around the same time, and you can see that these same issues are also causing some problems here in Corinth. These same questions. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 sets the scene a little bit like this, and I like the way he kicks it off. Paul has a way of introducing his topic, sort of summarizing the main point, and then unpacking it for a while. That's what he did at the beginning of Romans 14, and it's what he does here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 reads, Now, concerning things offered to idols. All right, here's our new topic, and now here's the point. We know that we all have knowledge. Okay, there you go. We're feeling like we're on the inside track here. Yes, those poor people out there don't know what we know. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. It's not about being right so that you can feel good about yourself. And it's not about, oh yeah, those poor souls out there, they don't know all the good things that we know. It's not even about, well, we better make sure that they know what we know so that we can both be on the same page here. No. It's not about being puffed up. It's not about being proud, about feeling like you're somehow up here and everybody else is down here. No, that was rampant at the time. Most of Jesus' clashes with the religious leaders of his day were because of precisely this. No, what he tells us is that love edifies. We're here to build people up, to help people grow. The work of the Holy Spirit, among other things, he has a lot to do, but one of his key works is to help each of us grow, to transform us, to restore in us that image of God that has been marred since the fall. That work that he's doing in each of our lives is what we are called to help with. To help each and every one of our brothers and sisters get one step closer to where God wants them to be. And he adds in a little bit of a dig here in verse 2. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. All right, and again, you can see, imagine here in the church in Corinth, we've got our two camps drawn up over here saying, no, I've lived my whole life with idols. I can't eat something that was offered to them. And the group over here is saying, you know what? It's not really that big of a deal. And both sides are waiting to see, where is Paul going to weigh in on this one? Therefore, okay, so Paul's, Paul's finally going to make a decision here. Verse 4, therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, all right, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. All right, so you see the camp over here saying, I knew it, and I told you so. None of those idols matter. They're just chunks of wood or stone or metal. It doesn't matter. There's only one God. Just because they call them gods doesn't mean they are. Each of the next three verses starts with some kind of a... Yes, all that's true. Verse 7. However... So hang on a minute. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol, until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Say, so, okay, but hang on a minute. Don't forget about these brothers over here that are still having a really hard time just saying that that idol that I've prayed to my whole life doesn't mean anything. But, all right, 
Verse 8, going back again. But food does not commend us to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. Say, okay, yeah, let's just step back for a minute and realize that in the end that that's not even that big of a deal. Yes, I can see that this is important to you. Yes, you guys are right. And yes, this is weighing on your conscience. But let's step back just a minute to remember that we're not winning points by eating or not eating. But then there's one more but. Verse 9. But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Ooh. Now we're getting serious. This is one of the worst things that we can do, is to get in the way of what God is doing in someone else's life, to be a stumbling block. And so Paul paints a little picture of what that might look like. Verse 10, For if anyone sees you, who have knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? Say, well, I don't know, I feel pretty uncomfortable doing this, but I just saw my friends from church going, and they're eating, and it doesn't seem to matter to them, so I guess it's okay. Verse 11, And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish? And Paul just doesn't let up for whom Christ died. Man, it's not just, well, okay, that's their problem. No. No, you are getting in the way of what God is trying to do in their life, and Christ died for them just as much as he died for you. Verse 12, But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Ouch. So, you're telling me then that I can be totally in the right and still be sinning against Christ? Just because somebody else can't get over their problems? Therefore, okay, verse 13, if food makes any brother stumble, I will never eat meat again, lest I make my brother stumble. <clears throat> Saying, you know what? Not worth it. It's not worth running the risk that what I'm going to do is going to offend somebody else and derail them from what God is trying to do in their lives. That is the most important thing. That is why we're here. Nothing should get in the way of that. But, 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 the group over here, but, but we're right. Yes. Here's how Paul kind of brings this all together. A chapter later in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The first 12 verses, he gives a nice summary looking over and reminding us how we should or should have learned from the example of God's people in the Old Testament. They made some mistakes along the way, and there's a lot that we could learn from that. And he comes down to verse 13, a beautiful promise that we often highlight for those trying to break the chains of addictions and bad habits. It's a beautiful promise, but this is the context it's given in. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 reads, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. That's one of those beautiful verses that you can put on a post-it note and stick it on your mirror. It's a good one to keep reminding ourselves of. But this is the context he's giving it in. And how do we know that? Well, the next verse starts with a therefore again. <laughs> Paul uses a lot of those, saying, yes, in light of all of that, in light of the whole history of God's people in the Old Testament, and in light of the fact that, yes, things can get pretty rough, but God is always there to help us with an escape, there's always another option. You might feel like you're forced to do something, but you always have a choice. In light of all of that, Verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from adultery, from idolatry. You can already see the group over here saying, I knew it. We should be saying as far away from idols as we can. I speak as to wise men, 
judge for yourselves what I say. And then he outlines the whole idea of the communion or the Lord's Supper, or if you grew up in other churches, perhaps you call it the Eucharist. This reminder, this acting out of what Jesus' sacrifice was for us. And he's con contrasting that with the food that is offered to these idols. That's where we get to what for me are some of the hardest verses in the Bible. Our scripture reading for today. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 24. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. I say that they're hard because it's easy to picture this as just, well, the law doesn't matter. It's been nailed to the cross, as some put it. You can just do whatever you want. No, honestly, trying to keep the long list of rules that the Pharisees had come up with by the time of Christ would be a whole lot easier than doing what Paul is saying we should do. Now, Paul's saying it's not just about if you are right. It's not just about doing what is lawful. Maybe there's something that is lawful, that yes, you have a right to do it, but it wouldn't be helpful. And it wouldn't edify. And then he goes on to tell us that Instead of just worrying so much about if you're right or not, what you should be doing is thinking about others, putting others first. Think about what impact your decisions, your actions are going to have on them. I think, man, that sounds a whole lot harder. And then he paints an example. Verse 25. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market asking no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. And back over here at this campsite, I knew it. See, all those animals, they're gods anyways. So doesn't matter if they're offered to a so-called idol, they're all gods. We can eat them. Great. Verse 27. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner, and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. So you don't need to worry if your neighbor invites you over, you don't have to have that awkward conversation about, well, it's a delicious meal that you made here, but was it offered to an idol? No, say so just go for it. Have fellowship with your neighbors, with your family. Don't worry about it. And over here at this camp, yes, I knew it. But, 28. If anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. Whoa, that's way too high of a bar. I have a hard enough time just dealing with my own conscience. Now you're telling me that what's going to determine what I do is somebody else's conscience? And you can already see Paul recognizing that there's going to be a reaction to that as he writes, For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? And he even continues, but if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I gave thanks? And that's where we get to a beautiful verse that I think is often taken out of context, but it is a nice summary of why we're here. Verse 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Every time you're trying to make a decision to say, well, what should I do? Which would be the best option? Always go for the option that glorifies God. That's a good way to live life. A key principle that we can take away. It's not, I don't feel necessarily bad. This one poor little verse is often taken out of its context, but this is the context it's given in. As you're trying to make that decision, as you're trying to respect your brother's conscience, 
whatever decision you make, make sure that it glorifies God. But we tend to just end it right there. It's easier that way. But he's still got two more verses. He's not quite done with the idea yet. 32 continues, give no offense, either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Paul is able to talk a pretty big talk, but he walked it. Paul's able to say, read the room, see where you're at, see where everybody around you is at. And he is the apostle known as the one who has all things to all people that he might win some. But I have to back up for just a minute. Verse 32, give no offense. I think especially nowadays, that's one of those cases where the definition of words gets modified over time. Nowadays, I think offense is often taken to mean telling me something I don't want to hear. And that's obviously not what Paul's talking about. Because if Paul is saying, you can go ahead and follow my example, give no offense to anyone, Paul certainly told a lot of people things they didn't want to hear. He talked about Jesus so much to people who did not want to hear it that he was beaten multiple times and stoned probably to death. So no, it's not just about, we can't talk about Jesus then. No. Yes, some might be offended by it, but that's not what Paul's talking about. No, here, remember how we started way back? Hear this idea from Romans way back there, this idea of how we, how we go about this. Romans 14 began, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. There are some things we are sure about. There are some things we cannot compromise on. As our children's story reminded us, you have to be able to stand up for your convictions, even if it can get you in trouble even if you can lose your job. And in the case of Paul, even if people will drive you out of town, and not just that, but chase you from town to town to kick you out of a whole region just because of the message that you're trying to share. But there are some things that honestly, there's room for debate. And that's where we can look at some of these examples from the time of Paul, these questions that you can see how sincere believers would disagree about how best to handle this. What do we do about those Jewish festivals? The Christ came to fulfill them, but I've been celebrating them my whole life. And this is the time that I get to meet up with my friends and my family. We all come together every year for these. Or the that idol, yeah, it's, I know it's nothing. I know that there's only one God, but it's still the thing that I've worshipped my whole life. You can see how people could come to some honest disagreements about that. And it's amusing, in a way, to me to see how as Paul weighs in on this, yes, both sides might get a little ammunition for their camp, but in the end, Paul gives them something a whole lot harder than an answer. He gives them a calling. It's not just about being right. And he even goes so far as to say that, yes, the one who disagrees with you is the one who is weaker in the faith. And perhaps that's what they think about you, that you're the one who's weaker in the faith. But Paul says in the end, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's the weaker one. If we really are following Christ's example, we should be putting others first. Taking into account, as we make every decision, what will most glorify God and what will most edify, what will most build up, what will most help people grow. Those are the two main criteria to take into account for any decision that we make. 
but that is a whole lot harder to do than just having a list of what is right. But that's where I have to start treading a little more carefully. You see, these two issues are not widely debated anymore. I haven't been in a church yet where there was a large argument going about whether we should still eat at that Chinese restaurant even though they have their little altar out front, or about whether we should still be keeping one of the Jewish festivals. I'm sure that that is still an issue in some places. But I'm saying it's not generally as big of a deal as it was back in the time when Paul was writing these things. But that doesn't mean that we've stopped finding things to argue about. I want to start getting into those a little bit. And I'll give you a little spoiler on that one. I think Paul was on to something. I don't think I'll often be able to come in as with an answer and a winner. That, yep, in the end on this great discussion, this side was right and this side was wrong. No, the answer often tends to be, how can you best help that other brother that you think is weaker in the faith on the journey that God is taking them on? And most importantly, how can we get out of the way? One practical way that I have seen this, it was actually just talking even within my own family here. One of those seemingly simple statements that just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. That, you know, one of my family members telling me that for him, what he came to realize for this point was that there might be some things at church that just aren't for me. That seems kind of obvious if you just put it that way. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, there's a lot of people at church. I'm just one of them. Yeah, it's, we're probably going to have some different things that we like. No, but more and more, church has sort of leaned toward this individualistic, and I would even say consumeristic style. The idea of, well, there's plenty of churches to choose from. If I don't really like some part of the service there, I can just go somewhere else where I like it better. It's the idea of, well, of course, if I'm shopping around, I'm going to shop with my criteria, and if that one doesn't work out for me, it's not that it's a bad place. I can still, you know, recommend it to my friends, but I think I'll go somewhere else. That's always an option can't stop you. But this idea that my family member was sharing with me was that, you know, I come to realize that there are some things at church that are there because they're important to somebody other than me. <laughs> yeah, it's not really how I would do church, but it means a lot to them. So I'll wait. We'll still get to the part that I like later. We'll just have that one little piece. And I noticed that most, we had a big pastor's gathering. There were I don't know, probably 75 or so of us in a room. And they had us divide out based somewhat on our personalities and found that the most outgoing and the most talkative ones, the most sociable ones, tend to have a bit of an easier time at church. But then as we found this other smaller group of more reserved, more reflective, contemplative, introverted kind of folks. I that man, it's kind of hard for us to find a worship service that we like, they were saying. Different people are looking for different things. But are we willing to think about what God is doing in other people's lives and just try to get out of the way? Another key example, and I'll throw in a topic that I haven't seen as much here, but I've certainly seen it kicked around. And let me start by saying that, well, I am a theologian. Talking about these big theology points is something that I enjoy. I can debate some part of the Bible, talk about it well into the night, and I have many times. I enjoy it. But 
we have to recognize there are some parts of the Bible that honestly we're not 100% sure about. And so it's easy to get to debating about them. One of those, as an example, who is the king of the north of Daniel 11? For what it's worth, and if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I personally think it'll be a whole lot more clear when it happens. I think that that's the way that prophecies work. (laughs) But I bring it up just to say that I don't think that there's anything wrong in trying to discuss and even debate some little point, a minutia of the Bible that we don't all agree on. We don't have to all agree on every point in order to be together. There are some points we do have to agree on. The Bible is still the word of God. Jesus is still the only way to salvation. There are certainly some points that are non-negotiable. But there are going to be some details that well-meaning, spirit-led people earnestly seeking truth from God can still disagree on because we honestly don't know yet. And I think that might sound even close to heretical to say out loud, but if you think about it on the other side, think, wait, if we already had everything all figured out, that's it, the whole Bible, every single verse, closed case, what else would we do? Where would be the room to grow? Where would be that next step? Just be, well, we worked on it so hard for so long, hundreds, thousands of years, trying to get this all sorted out, and well, we did it. Congratulations, we can all go home. Now, there are still parts that we're working on. God's word is deep enough. I don't think we're ever going to get to the end of it. And praise God for that. I think an eternity in heaven would get pretty boring if we had it all figured out. So for those points, Paul reminds us to, yes, receive one another. We can't just... And there have been attempts, usually at its worst, the idea of a a church that wants everyone to believe exactly the same tends to just kick out more and more people until there's only one person left. (laughs) That's the only way to agree on everything. And even then, I'm not sure. I've seen it happen, and it's not a pretty sight. No, Paul reminds us, yes, to receive the brother who is weaker in the faith. Yes, hold up those things that are important. But don't worry so much about those things that can just divide us. I'm not going to go so far as to say that you can't talk about them. But as you're discussing those things, keep in mind the impact that you're having on everybody around you. If you make church the kind of place that people don't really want to come anymore because they know that someone's just going to want to argue with them, that's not, that's not it. But it can be the place for just the small group for you. The place where you can come, gather your friends, dig deep into the word, and try to tackle some of those weighty topics that we still don't have answers for. That sounds like an amazing group. And let me know when you start it, because I want to come. But always think about the impact that you're having on everybody else around you. It's not just about being right. And I gotta admit, I feel it too sometimes. There's a certain fun, a certain joy in being right (laughs) and knowing that you're right. Especially if it's something, a question that you've had nagging you for a long time and you finally find the answer. You finally find something that convinces you. All the pieces fit together. Mm, There's just nothing quite like that. That is, I think, at its best, what the study of the word can bring us. Finding some new piece, some new facet that you hadn't quite put together before. There's joy in that kind of deep study. But Paul reminds us that knowledge, just in and of itself, just as far as it goes, tends to just puff us up. Whereas love edifies. Love builds up. May we never let let our knowledge, as 
Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians and in Romans. May we never let our knowledge get in the way of what other people are going through, of the journey that God is taking them on. Yes, of course, we should share the things that we are learning with others. That's, in a sense, my whole job description. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with sharing the good things you find in the Word with other people, but always keeping in mind where they are at what impact that will have on them, their conscience. Because at the end of the day, the most important things that we can do are to glorify God and to help build up other people. And one of the worst things that we can do is be a stumbling block to get in the way of what God is doing. So let us continue to grow, to change, to adapt, to learn, to dig deep, and yes, even let us continue trying to find the truth, not just so that we can be right, but so that we can be built up with it. All that's important. But don't lose sight of what's most important. Your brother and your sister, those church members around you, and not just the members, everybody here is the family. We're here to help each other, to support each other, and that's one of the beautiful things that I love most about this church, is how it feels like a family. And talking with more and more people here, I wonder, so why do you come? Especially asking some who come from far away. You probably have to pass a couple other churches to get to this one. Why do you come here? It feels like family. That's a good reason to go to church. But it does come with that extra piece that we don't talk about quite as often. Yes, your family is here to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. But we also have to consider the conscience of our brothers and sisters. And that whatever we do, we can help them on the next step in the journey that God is leading them on. That they, in turn, will be helping us on the journey that God is leading us on. So that's, so I was thinking of how to, how to summarize that. Like, what does that look like? How can you best express it? I was thinking about one of these songs. One of the ones that's not exactly a hymn per se, but a song. I would like to get the song team up. The song they would like to close with, I think sort of embodies this idea. We are called Christians, but what does that look like? Are the Christians the ones that are the most right? Honestly, yes, I think we are. <laughs> But we should be known as the ones who love. We're called to stand side by side. That's what it looks like to be a family in Christ. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your patience and your love towards us. Lord, help us to see others more the way that you see them. May we see each person around us as someone that you died for, just as much as you died for us. Lord, show us those ways, those opportunities that we can cooperate with your Holy Spirit, that we can help build people up. And Lord, keep us from being stumbling blocks. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.